Awesome. Well, thank, thank you for taking time today. Um, so I'm going to walk through um, one scenario where we're using petabyte uh, level uh, learning techniques. Um, so just to give a brief overview, we'll, um, we'll, we'll talk through a little bit of sort of what we're trying to um, use data to do. Um, I'll then uh, give you a, a nice walkthrough of, of what the petabyte is in this particular uh, case. So uh, lots of fun tweets in there. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about what are the, the you know the AI problems that we're solving. So we're solving across a number of areas, but I'll, I'll focus in on on ones uh, connected to data centric AI. Um, share a few learnings, and then uh, hopefully have uh, have a few questions. All right, great. Um, so first off, um, we're a company that helps um, predict what products haven't been made yet, but should be made. So um, if you're not familiar with, with how a large uh, consumer package um, goods companies work, um, a, a lot of times they'll, they'll actually wait for certain trends to, to surface. So if someone's talking about, for example, a turmeric latte, um, they'll um, they'll start to see that, and in fact, they'll wait for that to, to start to sell in small shops. And then eventually they'll do, um, a classic survey. So they'll they'll ask uh, you know a small set of people you know 100 500 um, some different questions around um, around products they might be interested in, um, and then um, if they're lucky and they jump on that trend first, then they they're they're first to get that product on the shelf. Um, as more consumers get interested in that, eventually um, you know yeah, others pick up on that product and. Um, if, if our uh, company has been smart enough to uh, to move first, then they'll have market dominance. Otherwise, they may be uh, playing catch up. Um, and so uh, uh, we, we believe strongly um, in, in this principle. Uh, the future has already arrived. Um, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Uh, so it's a quote from William Gibson, a uh, famous sci-fi author for sci-fi lovers out there. Um, and really what we do is we, we monitor all trends that we think uh, could potentially um, lead to this scenario. Um, and we, we do that on top of um, uh, big sources of data. data. Uh, and then we um, we predict which ones are actually going, going to uh, become big, um, thereby allowing our clients to um, jump ahead um, into, uh, into the future and, and, and be part of that uh, first. Uh, so just to give you a, a peek behind the scenes, we, we currently um, uh, monitor over uh, 400,000 different uh, distinct trends. So we hold them in a, in a ta taxonomy or an ontology. Um, and so they range across these, these wide set of areas. All the techniques we use are actually common um, uh, across these different categories. So we developed um, algorithms and, and machine learning techniques that um, work consistently uh, across these. And they, they also work in um, just over uh, 10 languages uh, now. So we, we do this at, um, at a pretty high level of scale. Um, so I want to give you an example of just you know what what is what this ontology looks like. So taking just one of those particular categories of supplementary nutrition, really within that we're trying to decide if people are uh, you know tweeting or, or or having posts and they're talking about different different products or different needs that they want. Um, we want to isolate just those that are um, that are in say supplementary nutrition. Um, so we we want things like energy supplements, but don't think want things like um, uh, prescription medicines. Um, so we're basically teaching um, our models to make those uh, distinctions. Um, so as you'd expect, we take a bunch of data, we do a bunch of machine learning. Um, we then have uh, humans um, in, in the loop doing um, expert curation. Um, it gets put into a, a big knowledge graph. Uh, and then we have a SaaS-based application called Trendscope um, and some professional services. Um, all right, so to it to the problem, the the, the petabyte. Uh, I found some sweet uh, ASCII art here uh, that I thought represented uh, my, my struggle with the petabyte. Um, so yeah, we, we do indeed have just a, a ton of information. So we have over five years of uh, of data from Twitter as well as a full um, Reddit fire hose and a, and a number of other uh, data streams. And our, our challenge is really how do we find the the right entity that people are talking about, but also critically in the right context. Um, uh, and then once we do that uh, successfully, um, it, it becomes structured knowledge, and, and we can use that to um, to make various inferences um, and uh, and help ultimately the right products be born. Um, so there are, there are a number of fun uh, problems, uh, 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 disambiguation problems primarily uh, in, in this data set. So we get to come across a lot a lot of fun ones. Um, the fact that yeah, both a basketball player and uh, and a product share the name Vernell. Um, this one was fun when when uh, Beyonce released her uh, her album Lemonade uh, many years ago. Um, that people were all of a sudden talking about uh, Lemonade a lot, uh, but of course they weren't talking about the entity that um, that, that we care about in this case. Uh, there's a classic uh, Red Bull's a really interesting one where since they um, 
you know, we want to track it as an energy drink because they also um, sports or sponsor uh, sports events. Um, it, it appears there. And then, of course, there's the, the classic uh, Picasso painting with the Red Bull. Uh, yeah. And then um, incredibly ambiguous uh, brands like Vim that, uh, you know, come across in uh, phrases like uh, Vim and Vigor and, and all the fun things that uh, that. Uh, people go through. Um, so as we think about our our, our different uh, spaces, um, where where you know we're solving uh, problems in, um, well, we break it down to the three Fs. Um, so fundamentally, we're finding um, uh, information. So um, as uh, many many folks at this uh, conference have talked about, um, it's semi-structured. So we'll be taking uh, data from all all different sorts of uh, places, from pure unstructured uh, consumer conversation to uh, partial um, ontologies that it, that exist um, in, in different places. Obviously, things like Wikipedia, et cetera. Um, we're then making a number of um, expert decisions uh, with our with our in-house team, uh, and then we are able to uh, use techniques like, uh, you know, and, and solve for problems like uh, knowledge graph completeness and other things. Um, we also we also then, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, we're doing forecasting. So in some sense, it's, it's very it's very classic, you know, time series analysis. Um, we do do some um, interesting analysis um, in terms of matching up um, things that are discussed in social and the actual products that uh, that end up uh, selling um, selling with the futures or benefits. Um, and uh, and re recently, we've had a lot of success um, uh, applying deep learning, so a technique called uh, TFT, um, temporal um, fusion transformers, um, in that space. I won't talk about any of that today. I want to talk about sort of this hard area in the middle. Um, where of course we're doing annotation, it has to be kind of at at, at scale. Um, we have uh, the the nerd problem, the book name name identity recognition and, and disambiguation, uh, and then we're really trying to do learning in the space of specific context. So I'm going to share with you guys um, just three three uh, lessons we've had uh, really over the last six months. Um, so first one. Uh, Obviously, weak supervision sounds fantastic, right? Like, who who doesn't want more training data? I'll I'll take more training data. None of my data scientists would would turn that down. Um, and and then when you, you know when you kind of you know read some of the some of the some of the background, I think this is from um, uh, maybe Alex Ratner's original uh, post. It seems like we're missing out on this whole this whole paradigm of AI, right? That um, you know we this whole a different learning technique. Um, and while um, a lot of that is true. We found that, you know, in, in practice, you obviously you have to look at the data. So um, the whole the whole uh, technique of probabilistic labels um, uh, are, um, you know, revealed some interesting things to us. So we, we're looking at a classic uh, uh, sentiment uh, analysis. We have a, a, our own uh, in-house sentiment model. We're predicting whether things are positive, negative, or neutral about a particular entity. Um, we, we collected um, uh, almost 10,000 um, annotations. That we consider sort of gold standard, um, so um, of, of high quality. Um, and here's what we actually saw. So just in the simple graph here, you see us increasing training data as we go from from left to right, um, and then you see our F1 score, um, you know, in terms of uh, accuracy and what, and what we're looking for there. Um, and so we we saw that um, you know, so we we use kind of what we call our gold data, so our, our original. Um, uh, training data that we spent a lot of effort on, uh, and then we use various um, weak versions, um, and we did them in different combinations at different confidence levels as well, just to understand the the raw effect. Um, and what we found was interesting. Um, so, you know, as as it says on the tin, um, uh, you know, getting weak labels out initially gives you a really good boost, um, and so that's particularly valuable in scenarios where um, you are. Uh, train, training data uh, weak, and so it's um, it's certainly better than um, uh, when you can't get more labels. Um, but in some cases, you you can. So in the, in this case, uh, getting from 200 to 500 uh, training data examples actually actually made you know put us right smack in the middle of you know is it really worth it to to use a, a weakly supervised technique or to generate um, these probabilistic labels at this point. And then obviously, as we go further, so the, so the black line is you know continuing just to apply more uh, uh, gold label annotations. And at a certain point, we see that um, we see that uh, you know start to um, overexceed in terms of uh, performance of what we can do with uh, with the weak label. So that you know, the noise slows us down or or, or, um, or introduces a problem at, at at a certain scale. So again, depending on the depending on the data um, scenario you're looking at, um, the, the classic lesson applies of no free lunch, um, and that you, you may run into real world scenarios where uh, where it matters whether or not um, you're, you're hitting sort of or surpassing this uh, threshold. 
Um, great. So uh, learning number two. Um, so I, I talked about how we're trying to make all these uh, different classifications. Uh, so here's an example. So um, we actually, um, in this scenario, we, we're um, using some of those techniques of asking large language models, um, doing uh, Q&A prompting. Um, so um, in, this, in this case, we've, we filtered down a set of documents that have the word uh, Mazagran, which uh, if you didn't know, I certainly didn't know, is, a, is actually a coffee drink. So it should be relevant. But then we'll come across um, uh, documents like this. So um, it has Mazagran in there, and, and that's accurate. And it even has actually this, um, this other term around the, the pottery. So if you looked at the image even, you'd say like, well, it looks like someone's talking about uh, a beverage, something they drink. Uh, but in fact, we see that you know they're talking about a scented candle, right? That that borrows from this. Um, so uh, this should be something that you know actually we say no, this is really not relevant for for what we're we're talking about. Um, if it's if it's a candle, we actually have a whole another another data set of you know air fresheners, other things that that this would be uh, relevant in. Um, and so um, the learning we had was you know we thought in in some way that we could just apply a lot of very simple um language uh labeling functions uh, against these so we took a dev set of uh, about 5000 tweets uh, we actually created over over 200 of these different labeling functions so one here is you can see the regex is where we're capturing candle um and that and that covered four occurrences of the of, of the uh, the dev set that we are looking against you can see other ones where we're trying to exclude things like um alcohol ginger beer um, and um, we, well, we ended up doing over 200 of these. Um, what you can see on the right-hand side is actually the, um, uh, the probability distribution. So were, were we able to, to, actually, um, to actually make progress on this? Um, and as you can see in the middle, um, you know, we really still weren't able to, to push out that, that distribution and, and get, the, get the classic U shape um, that, that you're really working, uh, looking for. So in this scenario, we found that actually it, 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 was, it was taking too much effort um, to, to, to get that um, overall payoff. Um, and so that leads us then to um, our, our final learning. Um, and so this one, um, uh, I, I think actually, uh, actually, um, uh, Alex presented some slides roughly, roughly along this, uh, but um, it was it was to remind ourselves really that you know label functions aren't just one one example or one uh, one one class. It's actually a framework to to plug in uh, different organizational resources, so knowledge graphs, uh, existing um, you know models, as simple as they might be, like like logistic regression. Um, some of the more advanced techniques like Q and A prompting, you know, um, all, all that really sort of sort of ties together. Um, and ultimately, what we care about is, you know, being able to observe those things um, in a in a uniform fashion and, and understand um, where we're making the right decisions and where, where different modeling techniques are are, are um, learning correctly. Um, so I have uh, just a, um, a a brief a brief analogy that I shared with my team to uh, to kind of drive this uh, home. So for those of you who've been in, in technology, you may have heard um, sort of this phrase that um, don't treat your your servers like pets. Um, so don't be precious about you know an email server that that's up. Um, you know you should actually just have a lot of them, um, and you should treat them more like cattle. So um, we, you know we know at the end of the day that um, you know. Uh, you know, uh, there are expectations that uh, cattle may not live forever, um, and there's been different movements in the industry around just making sure we have, you know, lots of scalable, redundant things. So, you know, we have a, a fleet of um, a fleet mentality, ultimately even infrastructure as code, so we can redeploy entire services and, and fail over events. Um, and so I think there's a similar sort of paradigm shift that you know that, that we're looking at here around around label functions where. Um, I, the analogy I like to, to use is, is, you know, why don't we treat them like animals in a zoo? So we don't necessarily want to, um, you know, send our, uh, our, our precious models to uh, the abattoir. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we do want things out of them. We want them to be accessible. Um, we want to be able to, to you know, uh, to teach them, to iterate on them, to feed them more data. Um, and ultimately, it's not, not just a data science task, but something where we want uh, human experts uh, to be able to engage uh, in, in them as well. So that's my parting thought here. Um, you know, treat, treat your models and all, all your other uh, lab labeling function uh, assets as something that uh, you can put in an open spot um, and that uh, you can monitor how it's working. And critically, you can look at the data to see, uh, to see how uh, it's working as well. Um, yeah, so that that's the petabyte that uh, that we have here at Black Swan. Um, it's it's not it's not how big it is; it's how many contexts it has that uh, that makes it tough. Uh, great. Well, with that, that was those all the the comments I prepared. Um, do we have any time for questions? 
Yes, uh, Peter, thank you so much for that great talk. It was very informative in terms of both the problem that you're solving and then also just learnings in terms of the real world in terms of using labeling functions in the learning sphere. Uh, so thank you. Uh, quick questions, a couple of questions around uh, the tasks that I noted as well as our snorkel team for the audience member. Also, we do have time for questions, so please keep adding some as you're digesting the talk and any questions that you may have. Um, so Peter, I know you laid out sort of the overall process that you're working through and then the specific labeling problem that you're tackling. Maybe you could tie us back into, you know, how does the labeling problem that you solved then, then trigger downstream processes or maybe just take it back to uh, what specifically was the problem here and then how that ties in, I guess. I'm, I'm sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no worries. So, so um, you know, basically, we're we're learning to make some some of these um, some of these different uh, distinctions between some of these classes. So, um, ultimately, we have to figure out what you know. If someone's talking about um, any any one of these um, potentially hundreds of different um, you know and thousands of different um, items, um, you know, are they actually talking about something that is non-alcoholic beverage or that actually fits in one of these categories or not? So that's ultimately where we have to learn lots of really small decisions um, and, and, and small, um, uh, you know, almost small, small model learnings as opposed to just training a, a big classifier that makes, you know, five or six decisions. Got it. So it's, it's sort of a more composable components, many different models being chained together for this, for this final task and the insights that you're providing. Yeah, uh, correct. Um, we have more, uh, one more question from the audience, or uh, we'll, we'll have more as well, but uh, could you explain a little bit more what you mean by composability and interoperability? I'm assuming that's related to your last learning around labeling functions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so when we think about composability, it's um, you know how how can we train um, one model that does really well? I know, so, for example, like one one area of um, irrelevant speech we often get is things talking about um, sports, as I mentioned, where there's lots of sports players with with names that um, that may overlap um, different brands we're tracking, um, and so there. Um, you know, we, we think about training a training a, a model that all its job is is to detect sports um, analysis, and so it can go and score score a lot of our, our different documents and say, aha, I think this one is actually about sports, um, and and then we could compose that with with other category distinctions that we're making. So being able to see how those things operate independently, you know, gets us out how, out of having to create the the one magic meta you know mega model that um that's perfect at everything. Got it. No, it certainly makes sense, the, the different composable systems that you're building together. Um, I'm personally curious, I know you talked about uh, like the sentiment piece as well as the different topics that you're talking about. I thought it was really interesting, the disambiguation problem as well, where you know if it's talking about them, it could be talking about many different things or um, uh, many different examples that you gave or Red Bull, et cetera. So could you quickly talk about some techniques that, that you think work well for this task in case people are curious as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so it, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, it, it is some uh, data science 101. So there's lots of different techniques um, in, in, uh, in, in named uh, entity recognition. Um, one of the big things we obviously do is actually use our knowledge graph to, 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 to boost awareness of that. Um, so um, if we detect other entities um, in, in, in a document that we're talking about, we can use those as supporting evidence. Um, to say, yeah, we're actually we're actually speaking about or at the right uh, context there. Um, there's also obviously just um, sometimes the um, as we look at things in the in the embedding space, there's enough uh, differentiation uh, within the underlying data to say like, all right, well, this discussion that's you know much closer to things like sports um, is is differentiated from this one that people are talking about energy drinks. So there's some of those things that that become um, clear, um, you know, j just just in vector space. Makes sense. Also, just the composition of, you know, what is the topic of the tweet and, and all the different models that you're building around, uh, you know, what is the, the tweet about, et cetera, would also help for the topic that would then disambiguate what the entity is about as well. So the entire system coming together. Makes sense. As well as the embedding itself. Um, there's a question around how long did it develop, or how long did it take to develop this? But I guess phrased another way, it's like, how did you think about building this entire system of composable models and, and what the plan was just starting from scratch, I guess? Um, and developing this. Yeah, I'd say I'd say we've been hard at work at uh, core parts of this for about um, three to four years. Um, and as with as with anything, we we start with a kind of a more simplistic model. So um, originally, um, it was kind of a kind of a simple taxonomy that lacked real understanding of you know um, you know uh, a, a food item has different ingredients um, and it gets um, sort of used in, in this scenario. Um, so we've matured it to the point now where we do have it stored in a, in a formal graph structure. Um, so, um, 
I think, um, you know, and, and, you know, into the answer around your, or the question around um, knowledge graph building techniques, um, a lot of times it is actually just, uh, deciding that high level structure and figuring out whether there's certain nuances you're trying to make that actually aren't going to be um, real, realistic in the in, in the real world. So we do struggle still with um, supplementary nutrition where, where people often talk about a, a, a you know, say like, I, I drank this um, beverage that was good for me. And then I also took, you know, this, uh, this, um, you know, extra pill where it's like, well, it's kind of in both discussion points there, right? So you kind of, you kind of need to, to, um, you know, decide when, when you hit a certain threshold and, and put it, put it in one or the other, or, or just allow for it, or for a certain amount of overlap. Got it. So sort of knowing when you've optimized enough and, and, and sort of letting go of the last uh, mile, I guess. Yeah, um, exactly. When, when's diminishing return? Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I guess along those same lines, it's like, you know, you're working with such a large amount of data, that petabyte level learning. So how do you even identify and deal with ambiguous data that cannot be resolved? Uh, like just the scale that you're working with, how do you know when you've hit this diminishing return? How do you explore that remaining data? Things like that. Yeah, I mean, so but part of that is why, you know, what we're still exploring in, in data centric AI and trying to actually set the thresholds of, you know, we, we've pushed we've, we've pushed this model as far as we're going to get it without without us investing a, a bunch more human time. So um, ultimately, we're, we're, we're guided by sort of uh, rough accuracy levels and, um, and and coverage levels. So as we look across these different domains, we can understand what's what's reasonably um, you know what what we can reasonably get things to and we can also detect outliers so we can say oh wow but, you know this this um this ingredients that we're looking at in in um you know pet food um seems to be quite different from the other data sets we have why, why is that let's go investigate that um right. so a lot of times it, it, it is that of having just some standards and, and trying to measure everything by that Makes sense. I guess one related question to that is given that your taxonomy is so large, even to get those accuracy, precision, et cetera, numbers, you have to label a large amount of data like across each category, right? So how do you even do that initial validation set creation, I guess? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Classically, you know, we've, we've gone all the way back to, um, uh, you know, shipping Excel files around, right? Um, <laughs> especially as we're, we're talking about, you know, we, we don't have uh, people who who speak you know eleven different languages, um, and so so oftentimes we are working with with third parties around that. Um, right now we're actually we're actually in a, in a process of I would say kind of our second loop of really just for, formalizing the, the the process, to make sure we're um, using APIs, uh, consistently updating our our, um, our annotation data uh, monthly. So um, yeah, I, it's still a challenge I would say. Makes sense. Makes sense. But then I guess that's where really labeling functions in this whole week's supervision paradigm has really helped, given especially that you have such a large taxonomy and, and getting those that data labeled. Uh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, I guess just one last question. I guess what are challenges that you get at the petabyte level scale that the you know you're seeing at your level working with this much data that people may not have considered that are tricky open problems that that you're exploring. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, you know outside of the just the standard the standard problems of you know, having enough compute resource and, um, uh, you know, w one of the classic ones is just, um, ha you know, deciding when, when to um, when to discard some things that, that um, you've learned or when you're st storing too much information. So, um, you know, having a data retention policy and be being okay to let some data go, it's probably the, it's probably the hardest thing that, um, uh, that, that, that you need to do. But, what, you know, once you get, once you get into that, um, that that frame of mind then you know if you are going to retain extra information obviously it has to have a clear purpose and has to have a pattern for how that's going to scale in your architecture so um it, it's always a difficult decision no one wants to uh, you know throw data away uh, right. but, but at the same time yet you know you have to you have to pay aws you know <laughs> at the end of the day right. so. makes sense i guess sorry along those lines um i mean there's just so many challenges that i can think of that that i would love to hear how you're tackling but it's, it's that storing the right amount of data, but then also knowing like if there's new categories popping up, if you need to retrain that data, that whole loop, especially with your taxonomy, I'm guessing it, it continues to update. So any thoughts there in terms of how you're tackling that as well? Like even once you get these labeling functions working, maintaining these models, setting up a retraining, monitoring schedule, things like that. Yeah, so I think in, in a lot of ways we can always, um, you know, for for a lot of our data sources, we can always go back and requery. So it's not it's not the biggest problem, and we we've optimized that part of our, our platform, so it's easy to to go back and get uh, get more data, even even data that we decided to let go um, uh, earlier. I think the retraining question is 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 a big and interesting one. Um, so uh, we uh, you know. 
Um, we we probably do it less now than we'd like to in the future, um, or you know, as, as we kind of get into our, our, our ML ops. So um, it tends to be when when we notice problems, you know, from uh, as we're analyzing things, as opposed to as opposed to you know seeing shift, um, you know, um, you know, in, in a in a regular fashion. So um, definitely definitely not a solved problem yet. Makes sense. But no, this was incredibly en uh, enlightening in terms of the, the problems that you're solving and how you're solving them and the learnings that you've had. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us here today. Great. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm excited to, to uh, hear how other people have solved these problems as well.